It's my distinct pleasure to introduce and talk about John Slosser. Now, John is CEO, as you know, of Cathay Pacific Airways. Cathay is based in Hong Kong and offers scheduled passenger and cargo services to 167 destinations in 42 countries. John joined the Swire Group in 1980 and has worked with the group's aviation division in Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United States. He was appointed managing director of the Hong Kong Aircraft Engineering Company Limited in 1996. In 2007, John was named chief operating officer of Cathay Pacific, and then in March 2011, became its CEO. In addition to his current role at Cathay, John is also chairman of Hong Kong Dragon Airlines and chairman of Swire Beverages. It's a great honor and pleasure to have John here. He's traveled a long way, and we're very pleased to have John tell us what's going on throughout the world and certainly about Cathay. So, John, thank you very much for being with us. Good afternoon, everybody, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone, especially friends and colleagues, for coming along today. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to have a chance to be here in New York and to speak to you today. Uh, as uh, Bruce pointed out, my predecessor, Tony Tyler, I think also addressed the Wings Club, and Tony, of course, now is the uh, Director General of IATA, so he's moved on to uh, even greater things than Cathay Pacific, is, if there is such a thing. Um, and of course, uh, I have to compliment Tony, I think. One should always compliment one's predecessors because then your successors will compliment you. And um, Sir, Sir Rod Eddington, who was also uh, the CEO of Cathay Pacific and then went on to become the CEO of British Airways, uh, once pointed out to me, um, and I'll try to do Rod's very well-known Australian accent, that you know, it's one thing to get a job and it's even more to know when to leave it. <laughs> And I think Tony got full marks for um, knowing both how to get a job in IATA and how to leave a job at the top of the world uh, as aviation would, uh, was at its heights after 2010. Now, if I may, I'd like to invite everybody to, um, I mean, mentally take a long journey to the other side of the world because that's where Hong Kong is located. We're pretty much 12 hours uh, different from New York. It's a bit warmer there. And we've all traveled in great comfort on Cathay Pacific on the way. And let me give you a little bit of an update on aviation as it looks from the Asian perspective. First, a little bit about Cathay Pacific and Dragon Air. I, I won't uh, bore you with a long advertisement for what, we're, what we are, but just a little bit maybe about some of the things you may not know about us and what, what it is we're trying to do. Um, so Cathay Pacific itself obviously has been around quite a long time. Dragon Air is a 100% owned sub of Cathay Pacific. Uh, we uh, acquired Dragon Air in September 2006 in this big tripartite deal with Air China, which I'll speak about in a moment. Dragon Air adds two very important pieces to Cathay Pacific, and they have really made a big difference in our development since becoming part of Cathay in 06. The first thing is you know, they have a large uh, network in China. Uh, Dragon Air flies to, I think, 23 different uh, Chinese cities at about 400 flights a week. Um, previously in Cathay, we did not have that China network, and so Dragon Air integrated with Cathay has given us a tremendous opportunity to bring people from around the world through Hong Kong and into China, and increasingly, and importantly, Chinese people from China through Hong Kong into the rest of the world. Dragon Air also brought into Cathay Pacific a narrow body fleet, and as was pointed out, we have an A321 of Dragon Air here. Cathay has always been uh, since I guess the mid-80s exclusively a wide-body airline, which I know is quite different than what you're used to here in the States. I should say something about Air China. As I said, in 2006, we did a tripartite deal with Air China, the result of which was that we ended up owning Dragon Air 100%. But effectively today, Air China owns just under 30% of Cathay Pacific, so they are my second largest shareholder, and I own just under 20% of Air China. So Cathay Pacific, Dragon Air and Air China are truly sort of wedded together and, and very focused on China and its development. Air China and Cathay are also 4951 partners. You can guess who has the 49. 
um, in Air China Cargo, uh, which is a, a cargo airline based in mainland China, mostly in Shanghai, but also with the opportunity to, to serve other places. Now, Cathay Pacific was founded 67 years ago, interestingly, by an American and an Australian um, who were DC-3 pilots during World War II flying the hump between Burma and Kunming, actually, um, you know, sort of in the Burma Road. Um, and I, I am slightly embarrassed to say, but I think actually Cathay Pacific was founded in, the bar, in a bar. Um, it was founded in, at the bar of the Manila Hotel in the Philippines, which is actually quite a nice bar, um, which shows that sometimes good things do happen in bars. Um, but as I point out to my 18-year-old daughter, nothing good ever happens after 1 a.m., so <laughs> don't be there at that time. We are based in Hong Kong. It's a fabulous place to be. Um, and as you join me on your trip to Hong Kong, one of the things you would note is that half of the world's population lives within a five-hour flight of Hong Kong. So we have a tremendous opportunity for serving really half the world from our Hong Kong hub. In a way, like in real estate, in aviation, location, location, location is very important. Today, Cathay Pacific is one of the top 10 international airlines in terms of RPKs and ASKs, and we are first in terms of freight ton kilometers. So we are the largest international cargo airline in the world. Now, when I say that, I exclude from FedEx and UPS their US domestic network, where they're almost a sort of post office, and obviously they're very large. But in terms of international cargo, Cathay Pacific for the last couple of years has been number one. So what are we doing in Cathay? What is our strategy? What sort of things are we bringing to the marketplace? I think those of you who know us would know that we, I think, have a, uh, a, a good reputation for offering really premium services. Uh, we have a fantastic first class, business class. Uh, this year we are the reigning, I suppose, winner of the Skytrax Award for having the best business class in the world which was a fantastically gratifying thing, and I'm glad it happened after Tony left. Um, but despite all this focus on the front end of the airplane, for which I think Cathay is well known, you know, we're not a niche airline. I mean, I think a aviation went through this period where we thought, well, if you're a business class airline, why don't you be an all business class airline? If you're an economy airline, why don't you be an all economy airline? And I think we've sort of seen that doesn't work. I think in aviation, you have to play in all segments of the market. So we carry a lot of economy passengers you know, around the world and between the world and China and, and between China and the rest of the world. We operate from a very efficient hub in Hong Kong. Uh, those of you who've been to Hong Kong would know that the infrastructure of the airport, the logistics, the airport railway, which will get you right into the center of town in Hong Kong in about 20 minutes, all of that is absolutely first rate. Um, and it amazes me sometimes when you see, you know, debates in various cities about whether to invest the money to have the appropriate infrastructure for aviation. Um, I think without it, I just can't see how you're going to track the volumes of passengers to come through the hub if you really want to be a hub. Obviously, if you don't want to be a hub, don't invest. But in Hong Kong's case, making the big investments in all the infrastructure worked a treat. Our hub in Hong Kong is especially efficient, I think, for getting passengers to and from China now. As I mentioned, Dragon Air has a big network there. Hong Kong, Shanghai, and back is one of the single largest uh, routes in the world now. We operate 16 in principle wide body flights, sometimes 321s a day. Uh, China Eastern does the same, several other airlines on there. It's one of the most dense routes in the world now. And certainly China going forward is uh, what we see as our growth engine. Cathay Pacific, we also hope, is an innovative airline. We, um, I hate uh, being interviewed by press people. This is a warning to any press people in the audience. When they refer to long established successful airlines as legacy airlines. I don't know what a legacy airline is. A legacy airline to me is an airline that's on its way to bad times or haven't thought of a new idea lately. We think of new ideas all the time. Uh, most recently, we introduced premium economy on our long haul flights, uh, which, was, which had been around before, but we were convinced finally that premium economy was gonna be a product available pretty much in all markets of the world. Uh, we started eight months ago, we're still rolling it out, and about the next two or three will be finished but we carried over 100,000 passengers in our first eight months with a small premium economy cabin, so we're pretty, pretty happy about that. We still have a great focus on personal service, which I think is a result of the great teamwork culture we always have in Cathay, and which I think is a characteristic of Hong Kong. And by the way, we are a founding member of One World, uh, which you would all know uh, as one of the three major alliances. Often it's referred to 
in the press, I should say, as, as the smaller of the three alliances. And the only thing I would point out is that One World has always punched well above its weight and is really focused on you know, premium and business passengers. And really, One World is, as they say, big in all the right places. Um, so where you're talking about premium travel in terms of uh, New York, London, Los Angeles, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Sydney, who's the dominant alliance in those markets, guess what? It's One World. And we verified this with credit card companies in terms of travel spend and everything else. So when you see those articles that only focus on the quantity of how many cities you serve and how many passengers, don't forget that there's a quality aspect to it too. Since I'm talking about One World, I should probably say a, a quick word about American Airlines, because I'm sure somebody's going to ask me about it during question time. Um, and I should say that I have no inside information, and I don't know anything more than you know, too. Um, and I'm not an expert on U.S. domestic, but obviously we are in touch with Tom and, and the AA team. We see them pretty frequently. I have to say they are great partners for Cathay Pacific in the States. Um, American is really a good operation for us, and we work together very well here. We appreciate the, the relationship. Certainly, Chapter 11 is a gut-wrenching process, um, and I see that on Tom and his team. Um, it's never as um, maybe as organized as you hope it will be. It's always more complicated than you thought it would be, and it all, always takes longer than you hoped it would take. Uh, and I think that's the case here. My take is that they will emerge from Chapter 11. I think they'll control their own destiny at the end of the day. There have been a, you know, attempts not to have that happen, but I think Tom and team are working very hard. I think they will exit with a very competitive cost structure. I think they will exit with a very, very, very modern fleet, which they've already ordered, obviously. And even better, and I don't know if you picked it up, but they are going to, over the next few years, really introduce some fantastic new products here in the U.S. domestic market. I mean, imagine flatbed first-class seats on U.S. domestic flights. Uh, that is not something we've seen before. Americans bringing that here, and I think that's a really fantastic development. And I, I admire them for basically saying, we're going to deliver value to our customers, and then we're going to try to ask to get some of that value back from the customers at the same time. I worry about an industry where you don't deliver value and then don't try to charge for it. I think American is looking at it positively and saying, let's deliver some value and then let's try to get our customers that it's worth paying for. I don't have any specific ideas about mergers with anybody, so um, uh, if you ask me, I'll politely be naive and, and not very clear. Um, but I think there are consolidation options still available within the United States industry, and I think American is probably well-placed to take advantage of some of those. So um, I don't know that there will be anything, but it wouldn't surprise me because I think American would be a great partner. Back to Cathay, finish on Cathay, a little bit about fleet and aircraft, um, and I hope that's of interest. We, um, we are 55% 50, 50 of our available seat kilometers are long haul. So that would be eight hours or more. So we have a, a very long haul route network. So aircraft efficiency is extremely important, especially at a time of very high fuel costs. So we are in process of transitioning to a, a fleet of 777-300ERs, of which we will have 50. And um, I was assured that that would make us the second largest fleet of 777-300ERs in the world in a couple of years' time. Uh, just to be balanced, a fleet of 60 A330 300s, which will make us the largest A330 oper operator in the world, and slowly phasing out our 747 400s. We had as many as 23. By the end of this year, we'll be down to 11 or 12. Uh, and by the middle of next year, even the end of the first quarter, uh, none of our flights of duration eight hours or more will be operated by 747 400s. We also have fleets of Dragon Air A320s and and 321s. Why this fleet for Cathay? Um, twin engine efficiency. We think that the, the big twins are really a sweet spot for us. Uh, certainly when you look at the, the length of some of the sectors we have to here in, in JFK, to Los Angeles, to Toronto, to Chicago, um, into Europe, we need something that can really fly a long way very efficiently and we certainly see the 777-300ER as the king of the skies in that way at the moment. It's been great for us, not only in range, uh, but the passenger and cargo payload as well. Uh, as I said, we are a big cargo airline, uh, and somehow with the 777-300ERs, even out of New York on a winter day, we may end up carrying five to seven tons of cargo all the way to Hong Kong, 15 and a half hours away. So that's very impressive. The big twins also give us in Cathay Pacific 
uh, very competitive options for frequency. Uh, with our target of premium passengers, you know, we want to have a choice of flights during the day. We want to have scheduled choice. So, for instance, here in New York, we currently operate three and a half uh, daily flights to Hong Kong. We did a little bit of trimming over the winter, but basically we'll be up to four flights a day. So, morning, afternoon, evening, overnight, whenever it is you want to go to Hong Kong, hopefully Cathay Pacific has a flight. You see this in other destinations as well. We have four flights a day to Heathrow. We have four a day to Sydney. We have three a day to Los Angeles. We have three a day to Melbourne. So the mental model is the big twins with their efficiency and payload allow us to you know, have this sort of great schedule choice in all these important markets. And we think that's worked really well for us. So frequency and product together, we think, helps us to win in the premium markets. Going forward, we have a significant order of 48 A350s, which is uh, the mostly composite Airbus aircraft. 22 of those will be the Dash 900 version, and 26 will be the Dash 1000. The Dash 1000 is pretty much about the same size as the 777-300ER. Mr. Albo won't agree with me, um, but we believe they are, uh, and should allow us to do most of the same things we can do with a 777-300ER with 15 to 20 percent less direct operating cost. So we think that will be a fantastic airplane uh, for us. Obviously, new generation aircraft uh, require some close attention, uh, and we are paying, paying close attention to the developments of the A350. Um, here's where I think we are. Again, nothing here is secret. It's all kind of public, but I give you my perspective. I think they've been making pretty good progress lately. They're obviously delayed from where they had originally hoped to be. Um, the first static airplane, the one that, uh, whose wings they will attempt to break, is complete now, and I think they'll start the static testing sometime end of the first quarter this year. The first flight test aircraft is now complete and on its gears and having its systems integrated and tested. Uh, the body joins, the wing drilling and all that, there were some issues, but they seem to have got by them, which is good. Uh, the engine, which is the Rolls-Royce Trent XWB, uh, thus far has completed most of its certification tests and as well looks pretty good at the moment. Now, it's obviously early days, uh, and I'm certainly not going to predict uh, what the end of that program will look like. But, um, you know, with each positive step forward, you get closer to the finish line, and that's how we look at it. Certainly, we think the, the, all, the mostly composite airplanes uh, will offer Cathay Pacific a huge opportunity um, for expanding our network and serving directly from Hong Kong, uh, maybe some smaller long-haul cities that we can't serve now with larger aircraft. Um, we think that the higher efficiency of the twins will make some of our long-haul routes that we now serve with 777-300ERs even better going forward. And by the way, all of the new aircraft are great cargo carriers, so we're paying a lot of attention on that side. Let me leave Cathay Pacific and tell you a little, a little bit about China. I spent a large part of my life, especially on the beverages side, in China, because we uh, in Swire Beverages have about 35% of the land mass of China which works out to about 420 million people. Um, so it's one and a third USAs in our franchise territory. Obviously a couple of Cokes a day and everything is perfect, um, but we're not there yet. Um, but if there's any doubt about the rising influence of China in aviation, uh, I submit that the purchase by Chinese investors of 80% of ILFC uh, is a sign that China's time has really arrived. That was. I think quite a stunning development, ILFC having such a long legacy uh, in the aircraft leasing business. On the way here, I, I stopped off in LA and I had a lunch with Phil Scruggs, who many of you may know, who's the, the chief operating officer of, of ILFC. I did offer to um, set Phil up with some good Mandarin tutors, um, and he's pretty good at that stuff, so I think Phil may be able to hack it. I'd say Henri Coupron with that French accent, I, I think may be beyond hope, but... Um, um, <laughs> But if he wants to make a go of it, I'll, I'll give him the contacts as well. But if you read the, the Airbus and Boeing global market forecast, they foresee uh, sales of thousands of airplanes in Asia over the next 20 years. My comment would be probably a lot of this will happen, not to those numbers perhaps, but a lot will, happening, will happen, and a lot of it is already happening. Uh, Li Jiaxiang, who is the minister of the CAAC, the aviation regulator in China, um, has recently stated that you know, China will be taking 300 aircraft a year for the next three years. So three and a bit years, a thousand aircraft. 
That's an amazing number and testament to how much the Chinese market is growing. It's growing because there are a lot of passengers. A lot more Chinese people are now entering the middle class because of their economic development. They have money to travel and they have desire to travel. IATA forecasts that over the next four years, 25% of the incremental aviation, incremental traffic in the world will be generated in China. That is both domestic and international. That is great for my, my partner in China, Air China. I think they're well positioned to take advantage of a lot of that. Internationally, the outbound market from China for international passengers is forecast to grow at 17% a year for the next 10 years. If you work that out, that's basically more than quadrupling where they are now. It's a fantastic opportunity. And averaged over that 10 years, there will be 25 million first-time international flyers per year from China. Obviously, not as many in the early years, more in the late, but averaged over that 10 years, 25 million first-time international travelers a year. I can assure you from all my time in China, this is true. It used to amaze me uh, when going there and talking with Chinese colleagues and asking them about, you know, what do you think about traveling? Would you like to visit? And every one of the person said, yes, I absolutely want to visit. And the way the Chinese think, they're very organized. They could give you their list in order of the places they wanted to go at the same time, even though they hadn't been yet. But they could say, yep, New York, Los Angeles, Sydney, all that. And it, it was great to see. Obviously, to handle all these aircraft, there'll be a, a huge boom in aircraft building in China, and that boom is already underway. CAAC is in the process of building 70 new airports, which will open over the next three to four years. That will bring the total number of airports in China to 230. Obviously, building the airports alone is not enough. You've got to have ATC. You've got to have other infrastructure. And frankly, doing all of that and having all that happen at the same time will be a tough challenge. Um, knowing some of the people in the Chinese ATC uh, operation, I mean, they know they've got some real challenges to meet that. So um, will there be some issues? There may well be. But will they get there? Yes, they will. And all I would say is uh, in the 1990s, uh, at the beginning of the 1990s, they announced they were going to build 70 new airports by 1997 in China. Everybody laughed at them. They did it, and they did it pretty well. A short word about Chinese consumers. Uh, in the market there, there are many segments. Um, China is not a market where there's just people following the group flag. There will be a lot of those, um, but there are a lot of independent travelers in China as well. Chinese consumers already, amazingly, are extremely brand conscious. Uh, they are pretty famous for queuing up outside the Prada shop and the, uh, you know, the Chanel shop in Hong Kong. But they know brands, and they like brands. Uh, there's a, this is a different characteristic already in China to what you can see in several other Asian countries. They're very brand conscious. Having a good brand in China is a very important thing. With that in mind, I have to say, last year, when Cathay Pacific won the Business Traveler China Best Airline in the World, we were very happy about that, because one of our goals is to build a great brand in China. The other thing about Chinese consumers is they're big spenders. You know, when they go on holiday, they really enjoy it. They intend to have a good time. They intend to patronize the shops. Um, and it's worth paying attention to that, because we'll have a lot of them visiting here. So in summary on China, Cathay Pacific, we're bulls on China, obviously. Hong Kong is now part of China. You know, my second biggest shareholder is a Chinese airline. They're going great. We see huge opportunity there. There are bound to be some bumps along the road. There always are. We'll have to deal with them when we get to them. No matter how challenging it may seem, I would never bet against China. They've generally won the bets when you bet against them over the last 20 years. Doesn't mean they won't have bumps, but um, if you continue to bet money against them over the last 20 years, you would have lost your money many times. We certainly see the development of China as a huge opportunity for Dragon Air, and we anticipate getting above 30 cities and five or 600 flights, you know, well within the visible future. It's a great opportunity for Air China, my Chinese partner. This is their home market, and all that domestic and international growth they are well paced to take advantage of. It's a great opportunity for Cathay and Dragon Air together because they can help feed the Hong Kong hub, and Cathay can carry them to the rest of the world. And it's an even more Amazing opportunity, I think, for Cathay, Dragon Air, and Air China together, because the three of us 
have a, an unmatched domestic network within China, fantastic hub in Beijing, fantastic hub in Hong Kong. Now, how do we take all this infrastructure, this network, and turn this into the obvious way to go to and from the world to China and back? That's what we're working towards. Let me now turn to cargo. I had some questions uh, in the drinks before lunch about cargo, and that was great because I wanted to talk about that. It's very important for Cathay Pacific. Uh, we have been a big cargo airline. Interestingly, for a long time, cargo, we considered the, the rock of stability in our business. Uh, during SARS, when there were no passengers, uh, there was always cargo. We had famously one uh, flight from Hong Kong to Taiwan, departed Hong Kong with two passengers, uh, which wasn't very good. Um, but we had 34 tons of cargo in the belly, and that's what, that's what kept us going at that time. Cargo was always growing, um, which was both exports to and from China, but also, I think, a phenomena of the, the disintegration in a positive sense of supply chain, such that, you know, in China they, make, they may make the iPad, but the pieces for that are coming from all over the world to be assembled in China. So it's always been, been growing. And of course, in, in, in uh, air cargo, you have that great statistic that air cargo accounts for about 2% of the volume of cargo, counting air and, and sea together, about 2% of the volumes, but 35% of the value. So cargo's always been a great business. But um, amazingly, for the last couple of years, the world seems to have been turned upside down. Uh, in 2012, the freight ton kilometers on a global basis were the same as they were in 2007 which means we had that big dip in 2009, came back in 2010, but by 2012, we were basically back to where we were in 2007. And actually, air cargo volume growth around the world has been negative for four of the last five years. Sea freight continues to be real competition for air cargo. So today, cargo is more unstable, interestingly. The rock of stability has now become probably the most unstable part of the business. We've still got directional imbalances, such that cargo from Asia to the rest of the world is larger in volume than the amount of cargo going back, but that is changing. Uh, the biggest growth areas for us in terms of cargo shipping are North America, especially the USA, uh, and Europe, and that means exports from this market to the increasingly affluent consumers of Asia. The other thing that's been a real big change in the cargo business, I think, is that the, the old business model in cargo of old converted passenger airplanes, low capital values, but low operating efficiency, cheap crew and, and just operate it that way, um, doesn't work at $110 per barrel Brent oil. Uh, because no matter how cheap the aircraft is, if the level of efficiency is that low, you simply can't make any money on it. So that's been a big stress on the business. The other stress on the business, I think, is that all of these great new twin aircraft, as was pointed out to me, are effectively within them all embedded 737 freighters. All of them can carry 30 tons of cargo on their own in addition to the passengers. So a lot of supply. But this issue about the old inefficient aircraft, I think, is forcing on the market an important need to think about refleeting. And that's a problem for the business because it's not been a high margin business for the last five years. And at the same time, as you're not making much money, you have to look at spending a billion dollars on new aircraft, especially as a lot of these cargo airlines are not very well capitalized in the first place. And in fact, even some of the larger, more established airlines who haven't invested in new cargo aircraft, I think are faced with the decision of do we invest or do we slowly exit, as Japan Airlines did a while back, as Northwest did years before that. So I would say the business uh, and the industry is going to be facing still some choppy times. As far as Cathay, we're staying in for now. China still looks like, um, and Asia still looks like, the manufacturing center of the world. There may be moves of manufacturing companies around, but China still has scale, and I think that's going to keep them competitive. We are on our way to having a fleet of 10 747-8 freighters, which are the, the new 747, the freighter equivalent. And uh, we've had them for about a year now. They've been good. We're happy with them. With those aircraft, we carry about 15% more cargo with about 15% less cost on the same routes. And that's taken some of the routes that previously would have been pretty marginal or loss making and enabled them to be profitable. So we're happy with that airplane. With pipped engines to come, Mr. McAllister, they'll be even better in a couple of years' time. So um, my advice on the cargo side is watch this space. 
I think the 2% volume, 35% value equation is still persuasive, but in terms of who's going to be involved in the business and on what terms they're going to be involved, I see a lot of changes in that going forward. Let me end my remarks. It's earlier in, early in the year. It's always good coming in January, so I'm happy to make some fearless forecasts because I've got the rest of the year, and that gives me plenty of chances to be both right and wrong. Um, so I do so with great courage. Warning again, I have no inside information on any of these things. You're getting the Hong Kong perspective of a few aviation issues. So here they are. First of all, there's been a lot of talk about the 777X, the next generation 777s. Uh, my prediction is it will be launched this year. There's been talk about it. I think it will go forward. Um, secondly, as far as the A350-900, um, I think it'll fly at Paris, at the Paris Air Show this year. So they will get in the air. I know they're very keen to get it done. I don't think anybody will cut any corners in terms of safety, but I think the progress will allow them to get it in the air at Paris. Thirdly, um, I think American Airlines will get themselves sorted and exit Chapter 11 in an orderly fashion. Um, perhaps there'll be some sort of uh, consolidation, but I think American will continue to be uh, one of the hugely important founding members of One World going forward. Fourthly, I think oil prices will probably remain about where they are now. Continuation of where it is is probably my best guess. Uh, fifth fearless forecast is that I think smart airlines uh, this year will start to understand that the environment of low interest rates is not going to be here forever. Uh, certainly in a capital intensive business like aviation, being able to finance aircraft at you know, HIBOR, LIBOR plus 100 basis points when, when HIBOR may be half a percent looks pretty cheap. So buying really expensive assets with that kind of interest rates, floating interest rates, uh, looks like a good deal. But I, I think the smart airlines will start to think that there will be something after low interest rates. And guess what? Your, your balance sheet's going to look a lot different, your P&L's going to look a lot different when interest rates are four and a half percent than they are at half a percent. Certainly in Cathay, that's something we've been embarked on. Sixth, um, there have been a lot of, of write-ups in the press about a fear that with all the new aircraft coming, there won't be available finance to finance them all. Um, I completely understand the logic. I don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, at all other times, somehow, every airline that need, every airplane that needs to be delivered has somehow got financed and be delivered. Uh, I would bet against there being a problem this year, see if I'm right or not. Seventh. Um, the ETS discussions uh, ongoing now within ICAO, and that's the, um, the European uh, carbon charging system. Um, I think they're going to prove to be quite a challenge. Um, I know there's a goal to somehow get a, a solution by, I think, September, October this year. I can easily see that maybe dragging on a bit uh, longer than that. Why? Because ICAO is every country in the world. It's the United Nations, and everybody has to feel that they're getting a fair deal out of it, and that takes time. So I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to force um, the issue. You may have seen, by the way, I know everybody here is probably aviation friendly, but I think it was the climate group who, who uh, did a study recently and reported that actually the impact of, of carbon from aviation, which is generally thought to be about 2% of the carbon emissions, is exactly the same as the carbon em emissions of the internet. Um, now, nobody reckons the internet is going to destroy the world, actually. Um, Occasionally I do, but, um, but I think that the perspective there is, look, um, there are things that need to be done, but 2% is 2%. Let's work constructively to a solution and not um, get overly emotional about things. Let's make positive steps in a rational manner. With that in mind, um, I need to just uh, say a good word uh, for my friend Matthew Baldwin in the EU. Uh, Matthew had the happy task of of launching ETS on the world and telling everybody, and airlines in particular, what a great thing it was going to be for them. Uh, you can imagine the airlines didn't necessarily agree with Matthew's view of that. Um, but Matthew, I think, was instrumental in trying to organize the time to allow ICAO to get involved in that. And uh, Matthew's had a tough job. I respect what he's done on that. I've given him a hard time several times in public meetings. So I'm going to tell him, Matthew, you did a good job on that. Two more fearless forecasts. Uh, number eight, alliances will continue to be important. I see there's a lot of talk at the moment that alliances are somehow going to disappear and just be replaced by bilaterals. I don't think that that's going to happen. I think you will see more bilaterals, but I think the basic alliance structure is still going to hold. 
Why do you see bilaterals? And there's a, there's a fantastic uh, quote uh, by Lord Palmerston at the time. Uh, this was in the 1840s, I think, and they asked him, uh, did, did Britain at the time have permanent allies? And he said, Britain has no permanent allies. We have only permanent interests. Um, and I think the reason you're seeing bilaterals is that dynamic markets sometimes mean that you have some different allies, depending on what it is you need to achieve in terms of your market, in terms of where your passengers go. But I see that as supplemental to the alliance structure, not replacing it. And one world, I think, here has the opportunity to take good advantage of that. And my last fearless forecast is that actually second half of 2013, we'll start to see better economies in the world. U.S. economy, we, we found in 2012, was not bad. Europe was kind of a mess. Asia held on pretty well. Uh, but I think we'll see a more general upturn in the world economy as we get to 2013, second half of 2013. Just to conclude, um, thank you all very much for coming today, braving the, the elements. I must remember next time if I'm invited back to shoot for July and not January. New York City and our flights here to JFK for day, very important to Cathay Pacific. It's one of our main you know, trunk routes. Both Hong Kong and New York are financial capitals of the world, and somehow connecting those two has been a great mission for us, and we think we've done it well. Our best aircraft, our best product are always on these routes, and we've, we've had fantastic acceptance here in the New York market, which we really appreciate. It wasn't mentioned in the introduction, um, but my first degree was actually at Columbia. Uh, here in New York City, so I spent four years up on the Upper West Side. So for me, having New York one of our main destinations is sort of as God intended it to be, and I'm very happy that it's so important to us here. And maybe close, close by saying, you know, the, um, in a way in aviation, every two years the world seems to turn upside down. Um, and if there were ever a nomination for aviation's official theme song, it would probably be the world turned upside down, which of course has an interesting legacy Historically, uh, when the British forces were defeated by George Washington uh, in Virginia at Yorktown, when the British forces marched up to surrender, their band played The World Turned Upside Down at the time. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the song itself dates from the year 1640. It was, that was during the Cromwell time, when generally it was the Puritan times in England and everybody there was just very Puritan. And the, the government at the time, the, the Puritans, felt that there was too much celebrating at Christmas, and they wanted to stop everybody from celebrating. They wanted it to be a much more sober kind of holiday where everybody reflected on all their sins and everything. And somebody wrote the song because they felt that Christmas was a time of celebration, and, and by trying to put this new effect, you were turning the world upside down. And all I would say, it's, uh, it's great here to be selling with everybody, celebrating with everybody. You know, a aviation's great accomplishments. Uh, and contributions to the modern world, because somehow, whether the world is upside down or right side up, you know, aviation is always going to be a part of it. And it's very gratifying, I think, for Cathay Pacific to play such a role in aviation today. So thank you very much. As a remembrance for this day, I want to present to you on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Wing Club, Wings Club this uh, memento. And it says, in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leaders Series of the Wings Club, New York City, January 2013. Great. Thank and you. John, thank you so much. Thank you very much.